Welcome, Rand. Welcome, Rand.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, this is Mike Barnes, the financial first responder. Hey, I'm coming to you today. Um, it is a Tuesday and I, my time is 11.09. So we're going to get started because I don't want to hold you up. Uh, just to- Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, this is Mike Barnes, the financial first responder. Got a little echo there. I apologize. Um, so I, as you can see, I'm I'm looking at YouTube, trying to work out these um, nuances so that I can answer people. So um, I do have uh, uh, my associate on with us, and he may be answering some stuff. So um, just bear with us. We're trying to work these technology situations out. All right. Without further ado. Hey, I, I'm talking to you today about um, law enforcement, military, police, emergency medical professionals, and firefighters. And one of the things that I want to point out to you is, is there's some things that are available that I think you should be aware of. You are the one percenters. You are the people that put it on the line. You are the people who actually are the people that are called when every everything else is in chaos. So I wanted to put some things out there for you and explain to you some things that you may, may be aware of and may not be aware of. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, first of all, I wanted to give you a little history about me. So just so that you know, um, I'm I'm of I'm of the cloth or I'm a part of you as an individual. Just so you know a little bit about me, um, I have been in the military for 22 years between the Marine Corps and the Army, and I have literally been um, in law enforcement since 2011 or 2010. I started out in the upper uh, left hand corner. Um, well, first of all, I was military police in the Army, but um, I started out uh, with the Maryland Transportation Authority Police. You see me uh, there in the picture. Uh, and then bottom left, I left the state of Maryland and went to the federal government. Um, and that's my graduation picture from uh, Flexi uh, down in Brunswick, Georgia. And then uh, upper... Uh, right would be me at uh, Department of Homeland Security, Federal Protective Service, and then, of course, my military um, service, uh, currently at the 86th Training Command at Fort McCoy. Now, just a little bit about, that's my military history, my education, just so that you know you're not dealing with uh, a complete idiot. <laughs> I graduated from North Carolina Central University in 1994. I went to Georgetown University where I got a certificate in financial planning in 2004. And then I went back and got my master's in business administration and finance from the University of Maryland Global Campus uh, in 2017, formerly known as the University of Maryland um, University College. So that's a little bit about my education. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this is uh, my family. For those who are joining, I just talked about my military service and education. Now I'm talking about my family. So this is my family. Uh, you'll see my daughter and my two sons. Um, my daughter is uh, is a... Um, is out in the working field. She's 26. My son is at the Citadel. He's 18. And then I got another son who's in high school. I've been married to this young lady for 30 years, 32 years together. So um, I tell you a little bit about my family and I show you my military and my police service and education just so that you have an idea of who I am as a person. Um, I always like when I listen to presentations and know a little bit about the presenter. And to me, being transparent is probably the best way to do that. Now, let me explain it this way. We do not offer tax or legal advice. 
Okay, and we are not affiliated with any government agency and any documents created for the purpose of enhanced planning or for informational purposes only. I am a registered investment advisor and I am a I have an agency as far as an insurance agent. So some of the information I'm going to talk to you about today, some of it may be familiar, some of it may not. And that's OK. If you ask questions or put it in the chat, I'll try to answer it. Um, like I said, I'm going between YouTube live as well as is as, as us being live on LinkedIn. So bear with me. So the first thing that I would say to you is, is I'm going to talk to you about tax. Now you're probably saying, well, wait a minute, Mike, you said you weren't going to, we weren't going to be talking about tax. Well, we kind of do have to talk about it a little bit because everybody is affected by tax in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, one of the ways that we're affected is, is you have sales tax. Would anybody disagree that there's no such thing as sales tax? There's sales tax on everything. Uh, stick a bubble gum to the, the vehicle you drive. You have property tax if you own rental property or you own your own personal property. You have Medicare and Social Security tax. Whether you are independent or whether you work for someone, if you look on your actual W-2 or you look on your actual pay stub, you'll see that you and your employer pay some form of Medicare or Social Security. You have income tax. Now, everybody knows that yesterday was uh, April 15th, unless you got an extension, everybody had to file those income taxes yesterday. Now, my favorite two is you got gift tax and you got estate tax. So when you give a gift, there can be a tax on that. And when you die, there's a tax. You know, there, there's a true adage to this that people who, who die pay taxes and people who give large gifts pay taxes, especially when it's not to your family. All right. So let's go a little further. Now, I showed you my family. Remember, I said, and I'm going to go back just for a second. We're going to skip a little bit, go back. Remember, I showed you these guys, right? And then I showed you I went to school and I showed you my military and police service just so you know who you were dealing with. Right now, when we get to all of these things here, there are four things that you need to think about. You need to think about how often do you play the game, the game of a state. And most people say, well, Mike, I'm only going to be able to play that one time. And that is correct. Um, I, I just got back from North Carolina late last night from my aunt's funeral. Um, and as I looked at her laying in the casket, all I had was good memories of her. But at the same time, I thought about, you know, because I'm in the industry, you know, what type of estate did she have? Because, you know, sometimes it's hard to talk to family about this type of stuff. Now, then the next thing you need to ask yourself is how do I know how well I did? Now, most of you probably have your stuff together. And then some of you, a little small portion of you, do not. And that's okay. The key is, is that once you know, then you can do better, right? And then the people that we leave behind are the people that are going to know how well we really play that game, right? Because how many of us had a loved one die and, you know, you don't have to be ashamed, but you had family members raid their house because... They wanted mama's diamond ring or they wanted the keys to the Camaro or the um, someone had a gun collection or something that was not properly titled. So relatives came and grabbed things. So we're going to be talking about some things that you need to be aware of. And then how many of you know people that have been in families where they literally had an issue with because somebody got certain that they thought they should have got, they no longer associate themselves with the family. Now, maybe, maybe you don't know anybody like that. Maybe, maybe your family loves one another. But what we found in the industry is that when people die, regardless of the love, you you tend to have people that get upset with one another over property and money. So to keep people from having that happen. 
A good financial advisor or a financial first responder or a financial planner, a prudent person would sit down with their clients and say, hey, let's put some things in place. So without that said, we need to talk about who owns what. Now, I'm about to show you two different things, but it's one and the same. So you have a husband's estate and you have the wife's estate. And most people will say, well, they're husband and wife. Yeah, but there are two estates if both of them die. They're not the same. So you say, well, what do you mean by that, Mike? Well, you have probate, you have contracts, and you have joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Now, I'm going to go in detail a little more about what each one of these are. But the first thing I want you to think about is probate means you have to prove. Now, people are like, well, what do you mean you have to prove? Well, see, when a person passes away, if they own anything in their individual name, whoever's going to get it has to prove that it is due to them. It's really all of your non-titled assets. So for you people out there that like to collect gold and silver, if you haven't put it in your will or you haven't put it in a trust, it's up to the courts to decide. You have tenant in commons, which there's nine states of those, which basically means that, hey, there's no rights to survivorship on that. And then you have your community property states, right? Those nine states that we're talking about that literally you own it 50-50, you own the debts as well as the assets. So I want you to think about that for a second. So now that we've talked about probate, that you have to prove who owns what, now we look at con contracts. Now, what are contracts? Contracts are simply, you've already designed these things and you have beneficiaries already um, laid out. So any one of these examples, and I'll use life insurance um, later on to talk um, a little more about how a contract works, but these are some of the things that you might have beneficiaries. Now, I always tell people, you need to make sure your beneficiaries are up to date. Because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to have a person who was previously married and they get a divorce and then they get remarried and then they leave the old spouse on and then they die. And now the new spouse and the children don't get anything because the old spouse rates it. Now, if you want to put in the chat, if you've ever heard of that scenario, please do. But I can tell you it's a common scenario. Or they leave their, their mother or their sister on the actual as a beneficiary once they got married. They didn't think about changing it. This happened to um, a couple of my clients over the years. And I know it's happened to other advisors because maybe we didn't offer the product to them and maybe they did they did. They didn't update their work documents because HR doesn't come back to you every year and ask you, do you have a change? They just ask you if you want to change your insurance. Think about that for a second. So the next thing is I said we were going to talk about the parties of a, a contract. So let's talk about this life insurance. First of all, you have the insured. Now, who's the insured? The insured is the person that the contract is written on, the life of the person. So in other words, they may have a $100,000 policy, a million dollar policy, $2 million policy, whatever it is, they're the insured. They did, they went and got the medical done. They did all that stuff. The next person that you would have is the owner. Now that can be the insured, but it doesn't have to be. So that's the personal entity that owns the policy. You have the beneficiary, that's the person who actually benefits from it. So let's say that it's your daughter, your, your son or your spouse, or maybe it's a significant other. That's the person that would get the actual benefit of the said face amount. And then the premium pair. So these are the four parts of this contract. Now, what I like to tell people is this, when we talk about money, there are three ways to transfer money. 
The first way is through your wages. Now, if most of you work for yourself, then obviously that's how you get paid. But some of you, you actually get paid by an actual job or from some form of salary. And then, you know, because of this presentation, some of you may even get disability benefits, which is a, a compensation thing. Your second way is you may have taken out a loan where you have a promise to pay. And then the third thing is a gift. Now, those gifts that we're talking about, that could range in any amount. So let's talk about this trust thing because most people give, give things away, right? And the prime thing that you wanna do is give it into the trust. That's why we're talking about the parties of a trust. So the first thing is a grantor, a grantor or a trustor. That's the person that's actually given the gift. The trustee or the successor is the person who actually controls the gift. And then you have a beneficiary. So I want you to think about this for a second. Let's say that you're the beneficiary and you got a bucket full of assets in the trust. That could be your house, that could be a car, that could be your jewelry, it could be anything that the trust is responsible for. Those are the things that people put in trust. Now, there are two types of trust. Those two types of trust are revocable, or some people say revocable, depending on what part of the country you're from. I'm country, so I say revocable. So you have irrevocable or irrevocable. And the first thing you need to know is, is that if it's revocable, that means that you can move stuff around, right? You can take it in and out. But once you make it irrevocable, that actually means that you don't have any control over it, okay? So we say it like this. While you're alive, let's say you start a revocable trust. Once you die, it now becomes irre irre irrevocable or irrevocable because nobody can control that after you die except the entity that you put in charge of. Now, this is what I want you to think about. The purse strings are, 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 are real simple. Think of a puppet master. If you want to control everything within your trust, then you want a revocable trust. If you want to be alive and say, hey, I don't want anybody to know I own this stuff and I don't care about control, then you want their revocable trust. So hopefully I made that clear so that you can understand the difference. Um, and you know, if you if you stay on to the end, I got I got, and you give me your email, I'm going to send you a special link where you can actually get this done at a fraction of the price. So community property states. Now remember we were talking about there's nine states. Now most of you, if you're in the military you like to go to places where you're not gonna have any state tax on your retirement, right? Well, in these particular states, and I'd have to match them up to make sure, but these particular states, these community property states, assets and debts acquired during your marriage, they're considered joint owners, okay? So 50-50. Now, when we get to why is that why is that really important? We talk about who we're going back to that who owns what? Because by definition, we talked about we talked about probate, we talked about a contract. Now we need to talk about joint tenants with rights to survivorship. Because maybe you set up your account like this, right? But in those community property states, those things, they are different than your regular states. And that's why we point those out. But you'll see here, if you labeled your house or your investment account, your bank account, then that other person that's on that account doesn't have to prove that they own it like they would in a regular probate. Because you were joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Now, we go back to the, that definition of who owns what. We talked about probate. Basically, that means that you're not titled, nothing's titled in your name. 
which means it's actually got to go through a court process. Contractual, you had your beneficiaries. Your joint tenants with rights of survivorship, you have a document saying that you have um, ownership with the prior or the decedent. So with that said, we now look at the husband, and I'm going to call him Jack. And we're going to say the wife is Jill. And yeah, I know it's a poem. Jack and Jill went up the hill, fetch a pail of water. Jack came down, Jill went around, now they got a daughter. So we're going to give them a daughter. All right. So in probate, in contract, and joint tenants with rights of survivorship. So let's say Jack owned a car that wasn't titled correctly. Okay. And let's say that he had some life insurance where he had Jill as the beneficiary and then the joint tenants with rights to survivorship, they own the house together or investment, let's say a brokerage account, right? So now what we have to do is we got to start that transfer process. But before we get to the transfer process, we need to look at the exclusions and exemptions for a husband and wife. So between a husband and wife, it's unlimited. Now, I didn't say your significant other, and I didn't say your common law spouse. It's between a husband and wife. The IRS is real clear on that. Now, your annual gift exclusion per person, you can give up to 18000 as a single person or as joint, meaning married, 36000 to your children. Or any person. When we talk about lifetime gifts, you're talking about 13610000 Now, as of last year, it was $12,920,000 that you could have given, given away to your spouse. But if you were given joint or up to that $27, $27 million, this is what you can actually give away to your spouse. Unlimited. But now that leads to this one question, because we got to talk about capital gains, right? Because there is a difference between if you gift it or if it's inherited. So with that said, you'll notice that if you inherit the property, you're going to get a step up of cost basis to the fair market value when it's inherited. In other words, the person had to die. And now you got capital gains on that. So we're going to use an example later, but I'll say it now. Let's say that you have a cabin. You bought it at 50, you bought it at 50,000 back in the day. It's now worth 300,000. So there's 250,000 dollars difference. You have capital gains on 250,000 dollars. Versus if it was a gift, you get you basically get the cost basis of Jack and Jill or Jack in this example um of 50,000. Now, I want you to think about something. There is a three-year look back. So if Jack gives a gift and then he dies within a three-year period, there is a three-year look back where the IRS can come back and say, hey, um, it's inherited property. So if you're going to give something away, you want to give it away as early as possible because if you die during that three-year period, they're still going to get the uh, estate tax or they're going to get the capital gains, I should say. All right, so we talk about who gets what. Now, here's the husband. He's got all these assets, and we got to transfer them. Now, you'll notice that in probate, it goes into intestines, meaning that it had to go through a court process. Contracts had to go to beneficiaries, and joint tenants with rights to survivorship went straight to jail or to their children, depending on how they set it up. But that's important for you to understand as far as passing wealth. And I understand that there's a lot of people that don't properly do this. I've seen it in my own family where people are like, well, they didn't have a lot of money. Well, I'm getting ready to show you some stuff later where it doesn't matter if you got a lot of money because you're still going to pay state tax on you. And that leads us to who gets what. Now, you're probably saying, well, wait a minute. I want my children to have this, my grandchildren to have this. I want irrevocable trust, and I want charity. I want to give it to 
my uh, church, my fraternity or sorority. I want to give it to my, um, I want to give it to um, the PETA or wherever. You're still going to have a process of, if you haven't probably set it up through a trust, you're going to have a property, you're going to have estate issues. Now, of course, Uncle Sam is your greatest pro is your get your greatest partner. Now, if you go by estate tax for states, you'll see in my area, DC, Maryland, they only allow you to give up to five million for Maryland before they start taxing you. The federal government, yeah, you you get more as far as the exemption, but Maryland won't stay tax. Now, I can't speak for all the states, but here are some examples. And God forbid, if you're in Oregon or uh, Rhode Island, they want to get as much of their, of their tax as possible. Now, this next group, are, and, and for, for those of you that are not familiar with phase-outs, on the inherited state tax, Iowa is about to go away, meaning it's going to phase out in 2025. So that means they're going to get their tax up front. Now, the important thing about Iowa is this, is that you want to you want to think about if you're in states where it, they're going through a phase out period, you could end up paying more depending on how late you wait to set your trust up. Or your documents, your financial documents. So you're probably saying, well, where do we go from here? Well, the first thing we do is is we schedule a strategy session. Now, I don't know, you know, about whether you're a financial advisor and some of you on um, YouTube are watching, but, you know, these are documents that your financial advisor, your financial planner should be talking to you about on a consistent basis. If you're dealing with a fee-based planner like myself, then obviously every year you're coming in for updates. Right. But these are the documents that we should be looking at. The second thing that we should be doing is in our next meeting is we should actually be looking at the actual recent analysis that we put in place for you. Excuse me. We need to update um, your income plan because everybody gets raises. They get bumps in their income on a yearly basis. If you haven't pulled a Social Security statement. For those of you that don't know, you have to work 40 quarters to get a social security statement. If you've been working 40 quarters, you need to know what your expectation for social security would be. And then any other appropriate reports. And then of course, step three, we take action. Because one of the most problems, or I wouldn't say the most problems, one of the, the problems that, that people have is they, they'll do something but they won't follow through. So then you say, well, wait a minute, you, you talked about trust. Don't I need an attorney for that? Well, yes, but what we have to do is we have to figure out what type of attorney you actually need. You see, because every attorney is not a state attorney. So um, as we get closer, I'm going to point out some things to you and give you an offer for dealing with some attorneys and I should be able to get you some form of a discount working with these people. I don't get paid from them. It's only strictly on a referral basis. I have to tell you that up front for pure, for pure transparency. But they should be setting these type of documents up for you. Now, what we do with those documents, once the attorney sets them up, is we put them into our generational vault. Now, what is the generational vault? The generational vault has all of your documents in it where you can get to it. And then we we allow you to set up videos to your loved ones. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. But let's say that you live in California and your children live on the East Coast. And you pass away. Now, child that's down near Texas, child one, has to make it over to California. And child two that's maybe up in Maine or New York or New England has to get over to California. They may not have time to actually find your documents because maybe they were in the bank and then they got to prove that they're who they are. But if they have access to this generational vault, they can go in because you gave them a code and actually see 
was listed. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look at this. So we're going to allow you to create your personalized loved ones a message. You're going to be able to hear what they actually were thinking when they did what they were doing. You know, I know we see these in the, in the movies all the time. I watched a movie not too long ago where the attorney came and read the will and people were all upset because this person shouldn't have got this and that. Well, this right here tells you exactly what they want. So I want you to listen to this for a second. Let me see if I can pull this up. I got to reshare. So we'll stop sharing. And then I'm going to share again. Let's see here. You may hear it, but not see it. This is called Legacy. Can you hear that? Let's see here. Can you hear that? have worked for years to provide the best lives we possibly could for our family. As we approach retirement, we started working with our financial professional to ensure that our retirement hopes and dreams will be Especially those including you and your families and your beautiful, precious children. Of course, it goes without saying that our friends are the hardest, sweetest, smartest, most amazing children on the planet. <laughs> but seriously, these last few years, we hung out our time. I say, we're going to find you the best place to be able to stop working on it. Join the culture of the big part of the But when I was removing the big time, I was starting to think about the way we see the big part. Of course, you'll always have the memories of the big person. The person is going to talk to you. I know we've never talked about our financial scores or how we want to handle our experience. We wanted to make it easy for us. Our financial professional has given us generational wealth to check out with all our financial planning information and everything now is working. The very thing organized. <laughs> it's true. I just, well, anyway, I wanted to explain a couple of choices we made. Two things we hope you'll do. First of all, we're leaving the Camaro to you. I remember the nights we spent working and driving a large team with nothing. We got Bob and Son for free as much as we could see the car. But I want you to know that I truly cherish this time we spent with you. Jane, we made your grandmother's diamond ring to you. You always wanted to wear it. Even when you were little, I remember you begged to wear it to your sixth grade graduation, and we had to use half a roll of tape in time to keep it from sliding off the finger. You'll also see a very substantial life insurance policy. And we really hope that you will use a portion of that off the off to maintain a cap. Now, believe me, we know that cap is a ton of work. But we can't tell you how much of a cap you have. In such what you have a chance to create the same kind of energy. But it's shocking all the time. There's a lot more to do. Our financial professional and all the items we have in these generational balls is helping you navigate all this when the time comes. Also, we all created personal videos. Now, thank you, Brand. They're in the legacy for these generations. You want to just be able to hear our own voices telling you how we are. How confidence in the
Okay, let me get these slides back up. We're almost done. In one second. Okay, let me get these slides back up. We're almost done. Transitioning is always difficult. Skip over these. Skip, skip, skip. More we'll talk about that. Skip, skip. We do a lot today. All right. Can you see my slide? Okay, so we talked about federal estate taxes. And what I wanted to point out to you is whether you are in you made a little bit of money or you made a lot of bit, a lot of money, everybody has estate taxes. There's no getting around that. People tend to think, oh well, I don't I don't have a lot of money. Um, I never made, you know, I never made over a certain amount. Uh, you could see where a person, depending on if they had 10,000 or they had a hundred thousand or they had over a million, they still have that estate tax they have to pay. You also will see here, once I click it. That there are two questions that people tend to ask us as financial advisors. Because when they see these numbers, they're like, man, that's a lot of money. So the first question they ask is this, like, what did they do to make so much money in their lifetime? Well, I'll go back to that social security statement. Most people will make a million dollars in their lifetime, but won't save half of it. So let's say that you, let's say that you made a hundred thousand dollars a year for 10 years. You made a million dollars. Right. And then whatever you bought, those assets over time, they grew. And so some of these people just bought over time and their assets grew as they grew. Maybe they bought a, a single family and then or maybe they bought a duplex Then from a duplex, they went to a quad and then from a quad, they went to an eight unit. And before you know, a person might have 16 apartment buildings or a storage unit or a laundromat or something, or they own a business and they put all their money in their business. And now these people are really worth this amount of money, but they never knew it because they never had a valuation on their business. 
So people, there are people walking around every day that are multimillionaires and you just don't know it because they, they don't talk about it. Most millionaires don't. And so you ask yourself, what can they do that I can't do? Well, it goes, it goes back to that, this here, you know, they've, some of them, hopefully, and I want you to think about this for a second. I got to go to Minneapolis tomorrow for a meeting um, with one of the companies I, I represent. And in Minneapolis, their big thing is, is Prince. Prince died without a will, nor a trust, all that money. We've had stars like Michael Jackson, Elvis, a lot of different people that passed away that didn't have their stuff in order. So if it could happen to a person that's got a lot of money, it can happen to anybody. But most wealthy people that have sought out advice tend to put their things in place. In one of the, they make sure they're not in probate. They either at least have a contract or they have joint tenants with rights to survivorship or they have a trust. So with that said, we talked about some of these examples. There are four ways to acquire wealth. Now, the first one is to inherit it. And maybe you have a rich uncle or aunt, or maybe you got both, you know, in your family that when they pass away, they're going to leave you something. Maybe it's land. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's stock. Right. Then, of course, the biggie is that windfall of money. It's an investment. You, maybe you put money in Bitcoin back when it was at, at its lowest levels and nobody believed in it. I actually got a friend that I know that bought a bought two um, apartment buildings with Bitcoin. Used it as leverage. This guy is, is loaded because he believed in Bitcoin. Then I know people who hit the lottery. There are people out there that actually hit the lottery and 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 but in most cases they lose it quick. Then of course you have people that earn it. They're executives. But my favorite are people like you and me, business owners. These business owners tend to have all their wealth in their business. They've poured everything in it. So when it comes time to sell it, succession planning, what have you, maybe they have government contracts. Maybe they have um, contracts with the state. Maybe they have just a large clientele that they service. They are, there are multimillionaires as business owners, but are they properly covered? So when we talk about federal income tax rates, you can look at your income and see how much you're expected to pay taxes as a single filer and a joint filer. And you can see that in the top three tax brackets, you know, if you're making, if you're making, you know, uh, 191,000 plus as a single person or 383, you're in the top three of the tax bracket. And in most states, especially urban markets, if you're at the 24% tax bracket, you know, that's, that's probably just scraping by because of the cost of living. I'm not saying that you can't live on it, but, you know, likelihood that the income ta tax rates are high based off your income. Then secondly, you have your estate tax. Now, some of you, you know, if you are a in the military, you tend to move to states where you don't have any tax on your retirement. But these are the states currently I, God forbid you were in California right now. That's 14.4% income tax as far as the state. Oregon, 9.9. .9. Minnesota, 9.85. Wisconsin. Illinois. New York. You look at some of these states, the reason why people move to Florida is because they don't have no state tax. I mean, no um, income tax. So these are the things that you got to think about moving forward. Now, I tell people there are three things that happen as you age. And this is going to happen to everybody, including me. You're either going to be too sick to work, so you better have some money working for you. You're going to be too old to work, 
You know, my parents are 80 and 74. And so they have what they have. Or too dead to work. You can't work once you're dead. So, you know, with that said, what I want you to do is I want you to email me if you're interested in getting that um, that free gift. Well, I won't say free gift or discounted gift um, for the wills and trusts, because I have a company that will actually do that for you. I just have to send you a link that basically says I referred you and then it will actually um, reduce uh, the fees that you would normally pay. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, when you hear how much they're charging you and that they're, they're actually reputable, because I checked this company out, um, you're going to be shocked because most wills, well, most trusts cost about 5000 plus. So when you hear when you hear the number they give you, you can just say thank you um, and, and, and send somebody my way. So um, without that said, um, some of you may have my number, call me, email me, uh, text me. Uh, you need to get this link and do this if you haven't got your will or your trust in place. And then if you want to sit down and talk to me about any other thing, um, I'm willing to help you, but that's, that's all I have for you. I'm going to cut the live off in a second. Um, before I start ask, answering questions, um, just clearly because um, when you're on live, <laughs> the last thing you want to do is put out uh, uh, stuff, people's uh, information. So uh, if you stand by, I'm going to just close this one and just go into uh, just a regular meeting on Zoom with you. So give me one second. Let's go back to... Let's do this. Uh, let me close this meeting now. And then uh, you got my number, right? All right. Just give me a call because I wanted to talk to you about some stuff because I know it's it probably would be beneficial for you with what you're doing in Dallas. All right.